We'll turn your Bibles this morning to Luke chapter 4. Put a bookmark. It'll be the full message before I get there. And then let's start out in Isaiah chapter 35. Holy Spirit, I'm asking that you would take this word that you have given to us this morning and bring it revelation so that our eyes would come alive to what you're doing and saying. God, help us not to be like Thomas that we need to see before. Help us to be like what you've asked, that we would believe because you spoke. And so I want that. I know Gary Wayne's tendency. God today caused there to be faith arise in this room that the presence of God would be manifest through his people in Jesus' name. Let's, turn, uh, let's start in Isaiah chapter 35. This is a prophetic scripture. Um, until you unpack it, some of it just doesn't seem to flow, but when you spend time. Isaiah 35, starting with verse 1. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. It is the bloom abundantly and rejoice. Even with joy and singing, the glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the excellence of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, Say to those who are fearful of heart, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the dumb shall sing, the water shall break forth in the wilderness and the streams in the desert, the parched ground shall become a pool. The thirsty land, springs of water in a, the habitation of jackals where each lay. There should be grass with weeds and rushes. I'm going to stop there. The rest of the chapter is excellent too. But I just kind of want to uh, um, get us on the page of the context of, of what the scripture is take, talking about. Uh, um, we're so removed from the culture of that history and even if you're a Bible scholar and you understand some of these things, the wording, when, it start, when the Bible starts to use prophetic language, sometimes um, we can get lost. And anytime you see things in Scripture that's, Isaiah's a prophetic book, chapter 35 is a prophetic chapter, whenever you hear phrases in there that talk about a desert blooming, that's not possible. Whenever you hear about waters bursting forth in the wilderness, that's not possible, okay? Streams in the desert, it doesn't happen. And so anytime you hear some of that prophetic language, that prophetic voice is speaking about a move of the Holy Spirit. And when a, dry, when a land is dry and desolate, seemingly dead, it's only the presence of water and or the presence of the Holy Spirit that can cause streams in the desert. So you have this whole chapter just reeking of prophetic meaning. And, and the voice of God says, when the Holy Spirit moves, the impossible takes place. I want you to look with me at verse 4. Say to those who are fearful, don't be afraid. Now, how many know that if you tell someone that's afraid, don't be afraid, it just doesn't pull their heart out. of it. They don't just go, oh, well, thanks for that. I feel better now, right? And so this prophetic voice, this instruction by God to say what he says only works when we say what God says. So the title of this message is Say what he says. And so when I speak what he tells me, the prophetic ordinances, the hand of God begins to move in a broken situation when I obediently say what he says, even if it doesn't make sense. 
It wouldn't make sense to say someone afraid, don't be afraid. Oh, I feel, right? But when you say what he says, you are given an invitation for God to move in a situation. And for time's sake, I need to stay with my notes because I can go sideways in this message in so many places. I feel an anointing here this morning that God wants to do something as a congregation, but on an individual basis to get my attention to listen and to say what he says. And so he said to those that are fearful, don't be afraid. Okay? Now, what happens? In verse, verse 4, God will come with vengeance. The NIV says, with vengeance and to divide in divine retribution, he'll come and save you. Basically, the short version of verse 4 is when you say what God says, he is going to get the last word in the situation. Right? We can say to one another, I don't, I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know how he's going to do it. But here's what I know. I am confident the God that I know, regardless of what I understand, regardless of what I say, because of who he is and because of what he has promised, something good is about to happen. It doesn't make sense. I don't get it. And just because I say it doesn't make it so. But when he says to say that, changes things, right? And so he says, don't fear. So when you say to someone that is afraid, don't fear, what's the next things that take place in our text? Starting there, I think, with verse 5. What's the next things that takes place? A supernatural move of the Holy Spirit in a dry and desolate place. Deserts bloom, streams break forth, parched ground becomes a pool for people to drink from. When you say, according to God's instruction, the eyes will be opened, ears of the deaf shall hear, unstopped. Leap, the lame leap, the tongue is looped, waters break forth, streams in the desert. When I listen to what God's saying, stuff happens, right? And so when I say what God says to say in a unique situation, that always draws his presence. I, I, I love the message I preached a number of years ago ca- talking about stinking thinking. And that whole illustration, stinking language draws the demonic. Okay? I believe this. Stinking language draws the, ben- draws the demonic. When I'm profane with my words, where do words come from? Usually... The heart, okay? And that's why Paul says, uh, uh, the, the scripture says, give all diligence to the source of what you're saying because uh, you're, you flow out of your heart. So God says, deal with your heart. And so if you tend to be a person that is negative in what you talk about, if you tend to be critical of people, I feel like right now, God wants to speak to you a word of deliverance. I don't have anybody in mind specifically, but earlier on in the middle of my, my, my song time I felt like God orchestrated the whole thing I felt like God said I want to prophetically speak to those in this room that have a negative tongue problem and right now in the name of Jesus I speak to that part of you to be broken away from you and in the name of Jesus deliverance from offensive language whether it's obscenities whether it's critical talk whether it's negative whether your mind continually t- uh, goes there God says okay it's time for a change and in the name of Jesus I speak to every situation that's involved in our life that out of the well of my heart would flow ugly things that would draw the demonic to my life right now in Jesus name I break that off you I don't understand this I don't need to but here's what I know 
Stinking words draw the demonic. But here's the exciting thing. The blessing goes beyond the curse, right? And so encouragement always creates an atmosphere of hope. And the opposite of stinking words are words of anointed praise by God. And what does it do? When I follow what God says to say, it always creates an atmosphere of, of, of hope. Saying what he says in a unique situation always changes things and attracts his presence into the very scenario where he's wanting to do supernatural things. Whether you get it or not, whether you understand it or not, can be irrelevant. Because sometimes I've been in the middle of a situation and I didn't know, I didn't know why God had me there, but in obedience I said what God said to say and God said, thank you for that, now I can move. Okay, And so I feel like God is saying, I want to create atmosphere in your life. I want to create atmosphere in your home. I want to create atmosphere in my community for the Spirit of God to rise up and miracles take place. So how do you develop a culture, an atmosphere in your home of hope? I'm not opening the floor to this because I don't have time for that, but (laughs) how do you create an atmosphere of hope in your culture so that your home's culture is one of hope? I believe it's what comes out of your mouth and the attitudes of your heart. And so when I'm in an atmosphere that I want to create godly atmosphere, it's time for me to exercise my senses. God, what do I say? And I listen, and then I begin to say what he says, and the supernatural effect of a godly person declaring the word of God creates atmosphere for the angelic to come. And for the Spirit of God to rise up and shatter the works of darkness. But far too often, I am so tied in to what I see and feel, I am more of a thermometer than I am a thermostat. Okay? And I love that whole principle. A thermometer just reflects the temperature in the room. But across Sealy Lake, from various backgrounds, various ethnicity, whether you're male or female, young or old, different experiences in God, God calls his people together in a community and he puts some of them down the road right over there because he knows down the road at the end on the right, there's somebody that needs to create atmosphere in that area. Up on Dabolero, there's some people that, that felt like I want or God wants me up there. People over here, people in Condon, God orchestrates light in the darkness and then he begins to tell you Speak to the atmosphere and as the people of God begin to respond without understanding and just begin to say what God says, the atmosphere in Sealy Lake begins to change. And the Spirit of God can begin to move. Now, the opposite can take place too. As a thermometer and not a thermostat, A thermostat sets the temperature, right? A thermometer just reflects it and just tells you what I see. But nothing changes with a thermometer. And so in my home, if I'm having a really negative day, if it's all, you know, here's how I know it's usually Gary. Everybody else in the room's idiots. (laughs) Wherever I go, they're all a bunch. No one's nice to me today. What does that say? It's a Gary Wayne issue, right? 
And so as a thermometer, I can just tell, there's just, everybody's so hateful. Everybody's just whatever. And I'm speaking the negative in speaking, instead of speaking the supernatural answer to the atmosphere that God has ordained you to be in. And this is good stuff. This is so beyond me. As I was writing this message, I was reminded of a, a book that we came across in our, our uh, Sozo training as, as a group, um, and, and recently I've been listening to it, and there's a book called, um, and I just look at the typo here in my, my notes, um, there's a book called Shifting Atmospheres. Um, it's about discerning and displaying supernatural forces around you. Um, it's by Donna De Silvia, and, and she has a supernatural gift to help people um, come out of bondages and things like that. But she talks about how important it is as a believer to understand that the atmosphere around us, we live in a spiritual world and there's a whole unseen aspect of supernatural beings that happen around us. And so um, a lot of times that supernatural battle between light and darkness is, is, is going on and I'm so clueless because I'm only tied into my feelings, what I can see, sense, feel, whatever. And and that book helps us recognize to take dominion over supernatural uh, environment. It gives you different strategies to know how to go, oh, oh, now I get it. Why did I wake up in a bad mood today? Why is everybody in the house a jerk? Oh, I'm in a battle. And I take authority I begin to say what God says and divinely change the atmosphere, if not over my home, in Gary Wayne. So the, the ugliness of everybody else in the, around the room that's all jerks, that's all on them. Now I'm having a really good day because saying what God says changes atmosphere here and then it changes atmosphere in my home. It changes atmosphere on my school bus. It changes atmosphere when I'm in the middle of a board meeting at school. It changes atmosphere when I'm driving and I go to the grocery store and I walk in and by the Spirit of God, I begin to declare the things that God has said. I don't have to get weird. I mean, sometimes it's fun, I know, but... um, (laughs) When I begin to say what God says, I speak out into the living room of where the enemy a lot of time gets to traffic. I take authority. What was that message you said? God says he's given you authority. You're seated in heavenly. Jesus said, I give all the authority I had. I give to you. Now you exercise God divine supernatural. I've got to get back to my notes. We won't get done. So the atmosphere around us is alive. And so that book, uh, um, Shifting Atmospheres, I just recommend it. That is, it's a good read. I listen to most of the books that I, I, I like that better. I'm an auditorial learner. In our text here in verse 35, what you see is we have two people speaking to another and Just as our natural body shares nourishment with the other parts of its body, so when you put nourishment in your mouth, the mouth doesn't keep it, right? But as the body is connected with each other, that nourishment spreads throughout the natural body. I just love the illustration because when I share God's word, something is released within me, within you, and something happens. So when the people of God come together and they begin to say what God says to say, you begin to create atmosphere, you begin to share nourishment with one another in the room. And I I identify with this, even though I'm a pastor, I have days like this, I don't want to come to church. And when I get here, it takes me a half hour to get warmed up to even feel the presence of God. And sometimes I don't have the energy spiritually to create a draft to suck other people into the presence of God. Sometimes 
I need you to create a draft that sucks me into his presence. And when we come together and, and, and spontaneously, regardless of what anybody does, regardless of whether or, or whatever, when I begin to focus my attention on God and I begin to worship, when I begin to say what he says to say, something happens in the atmosphere and the room get supernaturally charged with elements that don't even have to be spoken. Well, where's your scripture on that? And, and you don't have to walk home and say, well, it was this point and this point. I can't even measure the goodness of God that was released when I was together with my brothers and sisters in Christ and something you said supernaturally changed and charged me and, and changed everything in my life. Yes. It wasn't even Pastor Gary. Right? It's the body being the body. And so there are times when God is wanting to move in a situation. I don't get this about him, but it's very, very true. He's wanting to do miracles. He's wanting to answer prayer. Do you know the number one, this is a no-brainer, this is an obvious answer. You know the number one reason some prayers are not answered? They're not prayed. I short circuit right here. Okay? There are times God's wanting to do dynamic things and he's waiting for us to give him our attention and to begin to say what he says, make a decree. And so he is looking for an agreement. Oh, I love this. I'm going to camp on this sentence for a second. He is looking for agreement with those he has assigned positions and functions to declare and prophesy his word. A different atmosphere than what's here. I, I just got to back up and say it again. God has brought into Sealy Lake his ecclesia. It's not, the church isn't a building. The church isn't Pentecost Church of God. The church is a group of believers. And he says, where two or three are gathered together, and it was the Roman thing. They, they, when, the, when you had three Romans together, there were enough people to do business. They could legally do stuff. And so when Jesus said, where two or three are gathered, he said, you have more than enough authority to make a kingdom decision for good. And when he says, when you gather together in my name... When you touch and agree, he's talking there is a release of the supernatural to destroy the kingdom of darkness and set in light the kingdom of light. And so when he has divinely appointed, you thought you moved to Sealy Lake for this reason or that reason. I believe a God that orchestrates a gathering of light in the right places at the right time. And he says, okay, I want my church to be alive. I'm speaking to you right now. Recently, some of the message has been speaking to Faith Chapel is about his love, right? Time to pay attention when God speaks that clearly in a number of directions. And so God has divinely appointed you where you're at and he is looking for you and me to agree with him in my assigned position and function to begin to decree and to declare and to prophesy God's word. I don't have time. I think it's coming up in the, in, in the sometime near future. I don't have time to unpack this. And a lot of times it's my experience the, the, the church as a whole has misunderstood the prophetic voice of God and what it means to prophesy and, and whatever. And they think, well, I'm not a prophet. God's not calling you. To, maybe he is you, but God's not saying you need to be a prophet. He is saying to prophesy, prophesy. Paul said anybody that's a believer can prophesy. So that message and that instruction is going to be coming down the road very shortly. I thought about it maybe next week. We'll see. But when you begin to declare, when you begin to say what he says, what doesn't make sense all of a sudden comes to light, comes excited to light. 
1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 talks about when different ones come together. Some bring a song, some bring a scripture, revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. The instructions there is that when you bring something, contribute something that strengthens the body. Because when we get here, I need what you have. I really do. And I need you to be spontaneous with God to begin to speak, sing, prophesy what God begins to say. And when we come together, despite of what's ever going on in our life, when we come ready to deposit something in other people's lives, that's awesome. I love it when we come together and have church, have a, an experience of the presence of God. This spiritual movement, whether you call it a dance or a flow, a, 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 a creates an atmosphere. So this morning, just when you got here, when you walked in the room, you contributed a supernatural atmosphere to the room because you carry the supernatural presence of God. And so your voice, your actions, your attention, your heart, it creates an atmosphere in the room for the Spirit of God to, to, to begin to flow. And it's kind of a dance. And, and I've watched down through the years when the Spirit of God moves, it's kind of like an ebb and flow of waves coming and going. Sometimes it, it, the wave knocks you over and sometimes it's just a refreshing. But as we come together and we begin to see, say what God says an atmosphere changes. And what does our text say? The blind see. Ears are unstopped. The lame leap. Waters burst forth and streams flow in a desert. I, I don't want to go too far with this because we can get weird, but um, do you know anybody in the room that you think is blind to the things of God? No names. Don't point. Husbands, leave your wife alone. No. Is there anybody that comes to your mind that their ears need to be unstopped to the voice of God? Is there anybody in our community that's broken? They're lame. They can't walk. They can't carry themselves. Are there places in our community that's dry, desolate, burnt over? Are there places that would be described in people's lives that you know that's a desert. They, they don't have any life going on. They're alive, but they're not alive. They're dead, but alive. I believe as we come together and begin to say what he says, there's a supernatural atmosphere shift that the blind see. Ears are unstopped. The lame leap. Waters burst forth. The streams flow in the desert. And what excites me is this is not about how eloquent Pastor Gary is or is not. He doesn't have to be on. It has nothing to do with him or his message. It's when we come together in the name of the Lord and yeah. we begin to say what he says to say, we shift an atmosphere and the Spirit of God begins to do things that he wants to do. I love the scripture in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Those who feared the Lord, they got together with one another and were talking. They spoke to one another and the Lord listened and he heard them. I just love that. In this instance, they were being excellent with their speech. And God says, okay, let's get a book out and let's take notes on what they're saying. Let's write in a book of remembrance the things that they're saying. I want you to think about this. As God says where the Christians got together and what they were saying, God was saying, okay, this is altering atmosphere to the place God wrote in a book of remembrance because maybe it takes 30 years. Maybe it takes right now. But when you and I get together and begin to say what he says, God listens and he hears and he, get, he takes notes and says, do you hear what they're asking me to do? 
20 years ago, there was a group of people that sat down and started praying, God, I want to see this and this and this. God heard, God listened, and he began to take notes and says, for those who fear the Lord and who meditate on his name, God does his will through you and me. And this is good stuff. Holy Spirit, we don't get this yet. Because this is beyond our surface level. But I'm asking for a revelation this morning. What it means to begin to say what Holy Spirit says to say. Wendy, would you throw up the next text? Luke chapter 4. And do you remember how to take the background out off on the right? Um, there's kind of an X thing. I, I forgot to tell, talk to you about that. Now, now hit that there. Perfect. Last night, I kept waking up throughout the night with this going in my heart. And I just couldn't let go of it. I just, I just kept felt like God's saying, I want Faith Chapel together to begin to declare and say what Jesus said in Luke chapter 4, verse 18. And to give you the context, Jesus had just been baptized Holy, or God spoke over him, said, this is my son. Holy Spirit came on him, and it says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he went into the wilderness for 40 days, and after being tested, it says he came out of the wilderness with power. He was filled, tested, then power. First, one of the first things he does, he goes into the temple He gets the book of Isaiah and he reads the Mosaic passage and he says, let's turn to Luke 18, 418. Jesus read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He gave the book back and he, everybody was, eyes was on him because of the stuff that was happening there was supernatural. And he said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I feel that same heat on this message today. And and I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know whether we'll get to see it, feel it, or experience. But I have faith that this message is timely for you to be here this morning for you to join your voice together in saying what God said to say so that there can be a spiritual release, an atmosphere shift in my life, the life of my family, the life of the city, the life of our nation. Holy Spirit, the atmosphere can change. Because the Spirit of God is being released by a people who is saying, God, you have my attention. Now, I didn't practice this, but what I'd like to do, I'm going to say the first part and then I want you to repeat it with me. And I kind of paraphrased some of it just a little bit because I feel like God is wanting us, wanting you to say this together. So I'll start. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Spirit of the Lord is upon me. If you can close your eyes, that's a good thing. If not, just know we're speaking what God said. Let's try it one more time. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim the liberty of captives. He has sent me to proclaim the liberty of captives. He has sent me to recover the sight to the blind. He has sent me to recover the sight to the blind. 
I have been anointed to set at liberty those who are oppressed. I have been anointed to set at liberty those who are oppressed. God, today, we pray that your spirit would be released in us in every way that you desire. God, that we, your people, we give you our attention regardless of the noise in the room, regardless of the distractions around us. Father, today, we take this divine appointment strategically placed by a God that is orchestrating events in history. And today... We declare that the will of God is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. I declare and pronounce a blessing on every person in this room. So every curse that is spoken against you would be broken. Every curse that has been in your life from, from, from your heritage is broken off in Jesus' name. The various things that I've wrestled with today, God, I pray that you would liberate me from that and that my strength would become mature to say no to the enemy. But I pray over every one of us today that the word of God would come out of my mouth like that two-edged sword that would destroy the works of the enemy. We speak that over my family. I speak that over my friends. I speak that over the people in Seely Lake that don't even know their they're blind. They don't even know they're crippled. And in the name of Jesus, God, you do your work on earth as in heaven. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you what a privilege it is to join with you in co-laboring, taking the authority you've given us to change atmosphere where miracles can happen. Father, we are your people. Have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. Linda, real loud. Yes, God. Yes, God. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Well, I want to make it possible for you more this morning, if you'd like prayer, Dave and Brenda are going to come up and, and give you opportunity if you want someone to pray with you about something that, that came up in the service. Maybe you just want an extra jolt. You know, you can get second, thirds in the kingdom of God. He likes it when you go get back in line and come through again. He says, oh, you want some more? Absolutely. So um, God bless you today. Thanks for being in church with me.